So we were active. But I was an active participant. It wasn't like I was just a, uh, a housewife right. at that time. Uh -huh. can, can, can we skip ahead to that time okay. when things were so, um, I guess you would say, after Protestant, that, yeah. that when, when did, uh, uh, <laughs> when, when did uh, you first feel threatened or, 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 the, or the, the, you, you really had to worry about your defense? Um, are you talking about the last time or when we when we first organized rifle clubs and all, all that right at, the at the beginning? beginning. Yeah. Um, it was early on after Robert uh, became the president of the NAACP and he was becoming known in town as the president of the NAACP. Other people who were on jobs and who were members of the NAACP would tell us that, you know, these folks are saying they're going to do this to you, they're going to do that to you, uh, they're going to wipe out the family, they're going to kill Rob, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And then we began to get telephone threats. Telephone threats. And... Um, at that time, I started to realize that this is serious business. These folks mean business. They, they do mean to. They would call and talk to Rob? Or? They would call and talk to whomever answered the phone and threaten to do us harm, you know. They would talk to children, to the children, or uh, Daddy John, or me, or whomever. And they say, Rob keeps doing this. Yep, yep, yep. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. We're going to blow up your house and uh, all that kind of stuff. So, um, Daddy John, who was Rob's father, always kept a 12 gauge shotgun in his house at the door. And um, I remember. He didn't always keep it at the door. He kept it. He had one, and he kept it in his room, in his closet. But I remember one day when he pulled that 12-gauge shotgun out and said, we're going to keep this at the front door because if the bastards come over here after us, we're gonna, we may have to use it. Well, that was, as, by that time, Robert was going down to help protect Dr. Perry's house, whom they had threatened uh, that they were coming in and going to blow him away. Because, at that, just for the record, I know, but yes, because... Because he had been accused of doing an abortion on a white woman and uh, had been not only accused, but they convicted him of doing an abortion, even without a fetus, to prove that there was an abortion. And even though he was a Catholic who had refused to do abortions even for uh, local black people or anybody else, and who usually, generally did not even um, serve white customers. But um, because this woman had no so little money and needed medical attention, he let down his guard and let her in there. and. Um, then she was be, they were able to use her as a tool against him and uh, against our struggle. So, um, how had Rob stood up for him? Like, well, why were they going? Why would they go after Rob because of Perry? Dr. Perry was Rob was the president of the NAACP, and Dr. Perry was the vice president. So, uh, whenever official protests went out to the city council or whomever. It went out as Rob Williams as president and Dr. Albert E. Perry as vice president. And so uh, uh, Dr. Perry, um, he was just a part of our movement and everybody thought, not everybody, most of the white people thought that because Dr. Perry was a doctor, 
that he was the one who was the brains behind the protest movement. At one time, a man wrote a letter to the editor in the Monroe Inquirer Journal and said that what we ought to do is get that Robert Williams, bring him downtown and lock him up and make him write something because they didn't believe that Robert had the capability of writing the articles with the depth that he was writing. Some people are saying, well, that J. Ray Shute is the one that's writing articles, you know, and they're saying that he was writing and hiding behind Robert or some white man or maybe Dr. Perry. Yeah. So anyway, they, uh, they saw the two of them as a threat. And so. And so that's, that's when you all started to have Yes, 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 yes. Um, the Klan made a, 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 a run or two, it seems to me. I'm trying to remember. It seems to me that they made a run past Dr. Perry's house and shot. some shots were fired. And that's what made the men organized to go to defend Dr. Perry's home. The trenches and stayed up all night and in the trenches. They had sandbags, and our friend, Father uh, McAvoy, would come and stay all night. He was a great friend of Dr. Perry's, too. In fact, Dr. Perry was the one who introduced Robert, I think, to, Dr. Mac to Father McAvoy. He said, You all do the shooting and I'll do the praying. And he'd stay up all night and read scripture and <laughs> walk wow. around and bring coffee to the fellas. And so and, it wasn't just one night. It wasn't oh, no, this went on, you know, for weeks on end. And um, he would be there, you know. No trenches. <laughs> yeah, they had trenches and sandbags and uh, made Molotov cocktails that they were going to uh, use against uh, any vehicles that people would come in, you know. And the Klan, was, the, the, the Klan was fairly strong in Monterey. Oh, yeah. The Klan was very strong. The Klan was having rallies all over. Catfish Cole was oh, yeah. on the yeah. rise. Yeah. Catfish Cole was, oh, he was he was having all kinds of rallies around Monroe. Uh, one rally, they reported that they had 5,000 people out at the rally. And Rob and Dr. Perry and a few of the other fellows went out to some of those Klan rallies and uh, were there and <laughs> on the scene and it uh, I think it kind of unnerved the clan people when they did um, but um, that was what kind of brought on the um, right rifle club we organized a rifle club and got a charter through the American Rifle Association We practiced shooting. We were all members. I was a member as well. We taught the kids how to shoot. We'd, uh, we got our charter. We'd have our little meetings. And that was the backbone of our defense group. And it was like a, like an NRA type. That, that it kind of was it affiliated. Was it was a branch of the National Rifle that Association. Was they didn't know, I'm sure, because when Robert uh, sent off for the charter, he had uh, himself as an author. He had Dr. Perry as a doctor. Uh -huh. He had uh, some of the, uh, oh, he had one of our officers, McDowell, as a businessman. Uh -huh. He had, um, uh, I think, the women he put down, housewives. And he put uh, construction uh, construct contractor for the construction workers, and we got our first charter like that. And uh, it's really funny. The year that Rob passed away, the National Rifle Association wanted him to come to Texas to speak about how we survived in the South with guns. Was Rob tempted to do it? He was going to, but he his his cancer um, got the better of him, yeah. and he was unable to go. 
but he uh, sent a message to them, which they read, and I have a tape that they, at their anniversary celebration, they talked about Robert Williams and how his rifle club <laughs> allowed them to survive in the racist state of North Carolina. <laughs> I, I bet it did. Oh, it, yeah. And uh, we, we were just tickled to death that they did that. I like that. Uh, I'm sure when we joined and and the years after then, had they known we were a black group, they would have revoked our charter. I'm sure they would have. But in the later years, when they were under such attack for guns, uh, they came up with the fact that uh, they were proud of the fact, well, if it hadn't been for guns in North Carolina, that man would have been dead, you know. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> if he hadn't been affiliated with the rifle. <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> And that's true. But the ironic part that I want people to know is that although we had an association with guns, we knew how to use guns. Uh, we trained other people how to use guns, our children included. We never had the occasion to have to shoot anybody. And that is, you know, that's remarkable because a lot of people, um, when they think about having guns, they think about killing folks. And Robert always, uh, he was the ultimate teacher, always. And he always taught the other people and us that a gun is a weapon that can do terrible damage to people and the only reason you would ever pick up a gun to is for self-defense and not for anything aggressive or not to scare off anybody and uh, not to play with anybody but it was a serious business when you really had to pick up a gun that's sort of a rhetorical question mm -hmm. but, but why would Why would it upset a white southerner so much for blacks to have a rifle club? Uh, I mean, right to bear arms, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yes. Why, why, why was that so uh, upset in 1956 or 1959? Because they knew that uh, black people were at the point where they were demanding their uh, equal rights or they were at the point of requesting but actually struggling to get the equal rights. And they knew that if a, that if a large number of black people should take up arms, that they would either have to officially come down and that it may lead to a civil kind of civil war and they didn't want to that to happen. So they were going to do everything that they could. First of all, they didn't want to give in and give the rights up. But they knew much better than we did that all of that political power had to be backed up with. They were backing their political power up with guns. And the only thing that was going to take it away from them or threaten, right. threaten it was the fact if black people took up guns too. So I think that was the reason they were so afraid, you know, so they were going to nip that in the bud if they possibly could and keep black people from even thinking about resorting to resistance, not even, not even, not, nothing aggressive, just resisting what they were doing, keeping that power through the gun that they had. They had control of the police department, of the uh, the uh, state troopers, the uh, National Guard, and, and they didn't intend to release that power, and they felt that that was a threat to the power. Do you think that they were more threatened by uh, those guns than by Non violent protests. Oh, yes. Including y'all. I mean, yeah, yeah. There was, there was something about that's right. Guns that's right. That's right. 
they they felt more threatened by that because then that would mean that they would have to meet black men on an equal basis because that gun would equalize you you know and they weren't about they weren't ready to face that on an equal basis no so yes they were much more threatened by that than they were by the um, nonviolent protests Oh yes, uh, some nights we were fortunate if we were able to get uh, four hours of sleep and we slept in shifts at home uh, because uh, the threats, the telephone threats, calls, the hate mail, stuff would come through the mail saying what they were going to do, uh, people on the street, I remember one time uh, um, a little boy, his name was Prentice Robinson, I believe, was beaten up by some white men. They thought he was Rob's son, and they beat him up downtown. Uh, our kids had to, we had to restrict their activity. They couldn't go to the movies anymore, and they couldn't go out with the kids on Saturdays and play like other kids did, because that was after the it was known that uh, Rob had kids and that they were in danger. We um, had applied for them to um, go to what is now East Elementary School. And uh, the boys, we talked it over with the boys and they agreed to, to do it. And so we uh, tried to get them uh, into that school. And that in itself was a real experience that I can never forget, sitting in the uh, school board meeting and the pre pre uh, superintendent who was um, a white superintendent, always a superintendent was white, uh, Kirkman, never will forget Kirkman. And that was the first time I had seen a white man and a black man go toe to toe, and that was Robert and Kirkman. And Robert stood up to him in such a way that Kirkman was almost in tears at the end of that meeting. He was so angry and so, I think he was in a state of shock. Robert told him about the times that he would come into our black school with his hat on and call our black teachers by their first names and have them trembling and shaking and so afraid and telling telling the children, be quiet, soup's in the building, soup's in the building, shh, you know. And Robert remembered all of that. And when he brought it out in that board meeting and Kirkman tried to deny it, Rob said, you know you're lying. You know you did that, you know. And, and how intimidated you had all the teachers and how intimidated you had all of us as children. And you're gonna tell me that our school is as good as your school? Did you do that to the white teachers? You know, calling them by their first names, never a miss this or a missus that, you know. Uh, and I remember somebody saying, before there would be integration in Monroe, blood would run in the streets knee deep at that board meeting. And I was scared to death. I was scared. And I'm sure Robert had some fear in him, but, at, but he just stood up and he, he did all the talking. And I just sat there and they asked me, you know, and I said, yes, yes, you know, that's what we want, we want, you know. What but, he said. <laughs> yeah, whatever he said, that's it, you know. But. Uh, so you really had to, to, to uh, almost fortify the house. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. And uh, people would come and uh, after 
threats that we would think that might be really they might be really coming uh, we call and people would come and and from our rifle club group and sit up with us take turns sleep on the floor sleep on the couch um, but somebody would stand guard on the porch so yeah, we went through uh, a period when that was going on all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and at one time, we got uh, calls around the clock, just uh, nuisance, you know, just to keep you awake and to start your answer, and they wouldn't say anything, whatever. So... All those kinds of things were going on. Did, did the plan ever come into the neighborhood? Oh yeah, they came into the neighborhood on several occasions. Uh, I remember one night they came, uh, some some of them came into the neighborhood and uh, the fellows got out in the street and and shot above the cars and you could hear cars screeching and flying everywhere and they went out of the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't recall them ever coming back again um, after then. Yeah, yeah. Um, we had lots of support of the neighbors in the community because they were very proud of the fact that Robert was standing up and he was getting the young people to stand up with him. We had a youth group that uh, the ones who were picketing the pool, who wanted to uh, see a change. Uh, those young boys and girls, mostly the young boys, had been fighting each other before they got involved in the uh, civil rights movement. They had the Quality Hill gang fighting against the Green Street Gang and them against the Newtown Gang, but when they got involved in civil rights, they all started working together and having uh, good relations, and the gang stuff went down. Um, the older fellas taught them how to shoot, but also taught, taught them that they hopefully didn't, never would have to shoot but they taught them how to use guns safely and what guns are for. And so that, that was good. So the young people grew a lot mentally, intellectually during that movement because the older men and the women were taking the time to talk with them and, and to listen to them and uh, see what was going on. What were the big successes of the movement during those years, uh, say, well, before y'all left? Uh, survival was a big one. Yes, that, that was <laughs> the big one. That was the big one. Um, but if you had to, if you were just going to kind of list the... the I, I think the biggest thing was the educating of the people, uh -huh. the black people and the raising of the awareness of the need to struggle. Even though we didn't have a lot of victory victories at that time that you could say, oh, well, we won the right to do this. Well, we won the right to go to the library because the mayor said he didn't read anyway, or, you know, didn't use the library anyway. So little things like that. But I think the biggest impact was the fact that people began to say, yes, we do need to stand up. Yes, we do need to struggle. Well, that was something that kind of, you know, kind of struck me, you know, what you are just saying, Mabel, that, mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm a little surprised that the vision. I mean, Robert was ahead of his time. Yes, yes. And, and I'm a little surprised the neighbors were, I mean, he was a dangerous man to have around. Right, he was right. A dangerous man to have be married to. Uh -huh. <laughs> he was a dangerous man uh -huh. having your neighbor. Uh -huh. Sounds like he was a dangerous man having the neighborhood. Yeah. It may yeah. sound like that, but everybody knew everybody in that neighborhood who knew Robert and knew his family and knew his activity 
knew that Robert cared about his people. And they rose to, to the situation. They rose to the situation, even the especially the older women. Robert always was a person who would go and sit and talk with the older people and learn from them and listen to them. And they knew that. They knew that. I remember a Mrs. King, who was one of his mother's best friends. His mother passed away the year we were married, but one of the, her best friend was Mrs. King, who lived right down the street near us. And she came and told him one day, or hey, he went down there, and she told him, said, the FBI came down here saying they wanted to give you a job and wanting to know about your activities. And I told them, if they wanted to know anything about you, to go up there and ask you or your daddy or some of your people, that I wasn't about to tell them anything. She said, I don't know what them people were up to. They said they were from the FBI and they were getting ready to give you a good job. <laughs> and, and, and who's the lady that uh, hid, 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 hid weapons? His aunt, an older lady, she was uh, his... The one I told you that said, uh, the FBI said she was worse than him. Oh no, that's not, she. She did too. <laughs> but oh yes, but Mrs. Crowder, who was a neighbor a couple of doors below us, when we went back to Monroe, Rob and I came back to Monroe. Mrs. Crowder had some of those guns in her attic that had been there. She had hid some of the guns in her house. And she she was a domestic. Just a domestic, uh, uh, an older lady, a, a lady who had been in the community for years. Church who, going. Church going. All of these people were Christian church going people. And she was having weapons for Rob. Yep. 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 For, no, for the community. For the community. <laughs> for the community. Because she felt that if that community had to, if the clan came, those people were really. Our people were really fed up with the crap that the clan had been intimidating them with for all these years. I remember uh, one family, I think you saw me speak to a young man this morning, a young man who came in, he's in the military now, uh, he, no, he's retired from the military. He used to, he was one of our neighbors. And his grandma <coughs> told us stories about their family down in Georgia and how they had been run out by the Klan they had been run out of Georgia, her husband, just for speaking up. And they had run all the way from Georgia and had settled in North Carolina. Well, needless to say, they certainly didn't want to see the Klan come into our community and do what they had done in Georgia. Yeah. So, and most of these men who worked on the railroad were really... I'll say mentally, uh, they were not, they were impacted by the racism of the white workers on the railroad and how it impacted our community. They could see how uh, the white men had no respect for right. us. And the fact that most of the black men who worked on the railroad were they could never get a job as say a boiler maker but they would get the job as a boiler maker helper that's what daddy john was daddy john was the one who washed the boilers down and he was one who did the boiler maker work because the boiler maker even though he was he had the name and the job and got the pay most of the time he'd be drunk and he knew that he didn't have to produce. He had John there to produce for him. Right. And the same thing about most of our black, uh, the black men from that community who worked on the railroad. And they could see the inequities of the system and how they disrespected them and um, got away with it. But they were getting a big pay. And, and so... Uh, they could hear them talking about being clan members and, you know, there was nothing that they felt like they could do about it at the time, way back then, but 
they certainly didn't like it, and they passed that on to their children, you know, let them know that, hey, you know, these folks are no good for us. They don't really mean us any good. So... Mm-hmm. Was, I guess what I'm, it's kind of the relationship, the connection between the, you know, the people and the leader. Because I mean, I know, of course, your neighbors were tired mm-hmm. of the planet. Yeah. But neighbors all over North Carolina were tired of the planet. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, people have been through it. Mm-hmm. Everywhere. Mm-hmm. Or at least that's what I assume. I assume that that, that, that Newtown wasn't like that, that. it was a fairly average place. Mm-hmm. 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 Except it had. Robert Yeah, yeah. That maybe the people were ready. But, yeah. but well, you know, at a time, though, when Robert first got to be uh, the president of NACP, some of his old classmates and schoolmates would cross the street of town to keep from speaking to him. Well, right. That's what you were talking yeah. about. You were talking about this absurd yeah. nature of it. All. Right, right. And they were afraid. But the older people, the older people were the ones in our neighborhood. They were the ones who were the most supportive, it seems to me. I mean, the older, old folks. I'm not talking about the ones of Robert's age. I'm talking about these old people who were just fed up with the crap that the white folks were had put them through all these years. And when they saw this young man who was a product of their community, the son of Emma Williams, who was one of the known Christian women in the community that they had prayer meeting at his house, you know. And here is this young man that Emma had taught to respect us and to come and bring in wood and coal for us and do chores around the house. And now he's down there raising a family. He's teaching his boys to come and work for us and help look out for us come and read to us if there's something. We have some papers we don't understand. Call Rob Williams. He'll come down and explain them to you. You know, those kind of things. Those are the people that I'm talking about in our community that were, they weren't afraid of Rob. That's very and they would get so angry when they knew that, that the police were harassing him or somebody, you know, the Klan, was trying to harass him. How would they show their support? Some of them would, uh, I, I, were, were, you said, hide guns. <laughs> yeah, but that, that but was that was the, that not the norm. I see. But uh, they just never broke off any relationship. They, you know, they would visit or call for us to come and visit, uh, fix food for us on occasion, call us down to come, come out, fix the special part of this, that, and the other, you know. Take care of the kids when we needed somebody to babysit. So... We must need all that. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, but like I said, that was the older people, and they knew that uh, Rob was not teaching anything that was uh, detrimental to them or even teaching the young people anything detrimental. And sometimes if the kids were getting out of line, they'd call them Rob to talk to them, you know? So that's the way that went. <laughs> there was one incident that I wanted to go into okay. with, with, with some detail. Okay. Um, as some of it you were involved in, and I know you were I witnessed and others, maybe it was you, you were hurt. Mm-hmm. But the whole, um, Tim and I were discussing it last night, and you talked about it some of the other, the, um, kind of the, the sequence of events that starts with the effort to uh, integrate the country club pool. Mm-hmm. Um, could, could we start with that and just kind of take it from the. 
Yeah, well. And kind of ends as I see it when pretty much, uh, well, we know how to end the book. We'll get there. We'll get there. All right. But, okay. Um, well, it goes through the, the incidences around the hilltop and, mm-hmm. and, and the, the, them coming to your home mm-hmm. eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember that, um, I, I, as I told you before, I lived in, on Quality Hill across the railroad tracks from Newtown, where uh, the larger black community lived. And uh, I remember um, uh, a young, one of my neighbors uh, drowned in a mud pool, mud puddle swimming out in uh, on Quality Hill. That same summer, two or three other young black boys had drowned in mud puddles in, you know, trying to learn how to swim or just going swimming, you know, hot down here. Yeah, yeah, right. And so um, Robert and uh, Robert had said, well, this is just outrageous. So we got this pool down here and I don't know how he found out that the pool was built by the WPA with federal dollars you got this pool down here supported by tax dollars and it's restricted to white only and he said uh, let's go before the city council and ask them for a day that they would set aside so that our black kids can swim. Now that was not a, to us, that was, you know, hey, it wasn't revolutionary, it was just asking for one day. Did, or did some day. Did really not think of it though as, was, was... No, no. We just thought that, you know, well they could set aside a day. I think, I think Robert thought that the city fathers would do that. When he went before them and and uh, presented that to well, what about setting aside? I think at first they just said some time, so that the black kids could come in and swim. He really at that time, I don't think he even thought that they would say no. But when they said no, they couldn't do that because. Every time the black kids swam, they would have to drain the pool before the whites could use it again. Did they explain that they have any argument? Like what? This was just no, because black people had been in it. That was the that was enough. That was enough. At first, they at first he didn't ask for a day. He asked. Could you build a pool in our neighborhood? That's what they asked. Separate but equal, right? Right. Didn't even have to be equal. We're just asking for a separate Separate. pool. Right. No, can't do that. City Council, City Recreation Department, we can't do that. We don't have the money. Then they went back and asked, well, if you don't have the money to build a pool in our neighborhood, could you set aside some time when our kids can use the pool that you have. Because after all, it was built with federal funds and it is tax supported by the Recreation Committee of the city. And after all, black people do pay taxes. And uh, they can't, they don't, they couldn't do that. And that's when they brought up the fact that they'd have to drain the pool and wash it out every time. So Robert really got angry after they finally went and, and told them that no, there was, there was no way and there was nothing that they were going to do. They weren't going to even try to do anything to help relieve the situation. So he told them, said, well, you know, if you want segregation, segregation is very expensive. And if you can't afford it, then you don't need it. And that's when he came back and the, uh, we started to organize demonstrations around the pool. And, and what would they be? They would be? Uh, our young people and Rob and would get together and they'd go down to the pool and pick it around the pool. With signs and everything? With signs, yes. Yeah, signs and 
this pool built with federal funds. We have a right to swim. Open up the pool, let us swim once a week or whatever. I don't even remember all of the signs. And maybe, maybe the newspapers recorded. I'm sure they did record sure, it. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But most of the time when I was, I didn't pick it. I was in the car with guns. <laughs> but I was not picketing. But I was like always there. Roll, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I was always there uh, in the car. Not always, but part of the time I was there in the car. And each time that I was there in the car, there was a gun in the car with me. And, and um, you were just, just sitting there waiting and, you know. In case the situation arose. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When we had to protect the kids and get them out of there. My younger son was, uh, I think my older son was allowed to go down and pick it with the kids as well. Mm -hmm. So, at that time, you know, guns were legal as long as they were not concealed in North Carolina. So we had the guns on the seat. <laughs> they were not concealed. Anybody walking up could see that the guns were there. I'm sure they noticed them too. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, I'm sure they did. So, um... And during that time, did I tell you that Rob had run for mayor? I never heard that. You never heard that? He ran That's for the mayor the of Monroe? That's not in the book either, I don't think. I don't, I don't recall whether it is or not, but uh, he ran for mayor of Monroe. And then the night of the counting of the votes, went downtown by himself with his guns on to watch them count the votes. And I got on the phone and called the rifle club members and told them. And so by the time they got through counting the votes, there was a group of black men down there <laughs> with, guns. with guns waiting for him to finish looking at the... He said, well, I didn't want anybody to put their lives on the line for me, so he wouldn't tell anybody he was going. But I told him that he, that he was down there by and himself. And he wore his guns where people could see him? Oh, yeah. He wore them in a, in a holster on his was hip. One? Oh, yeah. Sometimes he would wear two guns. Was this... Legal. legal by legal. Yeah, yeah, but typical for Robert at that time? He would go around to town with... Um, wearing, he's... He, wearing a... He didn't. He didn't do that often, because most of the time he just had it in the car. But when he started getting threats, then he started doing that. And especially when they had a Klansman on the courthouse square, getting petitions to run Robert and Dr. Perry out of town. A Klansman with a table on the courthouse. Lawn. So what I would wear, wear a holster? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Robert went up to this Klansman who was uh, getting petitions and asked him, said, well, who is this Robert Williams? Do you know him? And he said, no, I don't know him. Said he's, But he's a dangerous <laughs> man causing a lot of problems here in in Monroe, and we and and we want to get rid of him, you know. And Robert said he told him, said, "Well, uh, I tell you who Robert Williams is. I'm Robert Williams, and if you're planning to run me out of town, it's going to take more than a petition." And he said to Clay, "Well, I I just want to let you. Know. I don't know. I didn't know this. Now I'm just doing what they told me to do." You know? <laughs> Oh, but uh, it was after then. But because they had somebody named Hornbecker, who was a Klan recruiter, and Robert had seen him several times at the police station. And that also made him know that the officials were allowing him to recruit right on the, on the uh, grounds of the law. And so when Rob found out about the law saying that you can carry, you can have a gun as long as it's not concealed, he started wearing his to let them know, well, you can petition, but don't try to do it physically, you know. So back to the pool, so, so the protest, the protest <laughs> goes on. Yeah. It, it goes on for a long time, or? or? Um, 
over a period of weeks and maybe protest one day and then not go back for a week. How did white people and, react to the pools? Um, at first it was just a giggly kind of thing. The, the people would come out of the pool and look and laugh and and uh, but uh, then the pool officials would get scared and close the pool and then they would have to come out and leave and um, so strangely enough we had a young woman visiting us from Japan an exchange student who whom Rob had met when he was on a speaking tour as for the Friends of Cuba and she had wanted to come south to see what the civil rights movement was about. She was a political science teacher. By the way, she has remained friends over these years. Yes, yes. I just had contact with her a couple of months ago. And uh, she came down. Rob had told her, yes, you can come to Monroe and we'll let you see what it's all about. And he took her around to places and sent her on her own to places to get information about what she wanted to know about. Uh, strangely enough, during that time, because the Japanese are, I don't know for what reason, but they were looked on as uh, white. How they got yeah, decided. I don't know how that got decided either, but she w she went inside the pool while we were outside protesting. <laughs> that would have been interesting. And she was a guest in our house, but they never knew that when she was inside the pool. Uh, and she had gone down, and they had allowed her to interview officials, and she found out how they felt about us, and they were just really candid about those old Negroes over there and what they're doing, you know. And, uh, yeah, that was also very interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, she wrote about it in uh, Japan. In uh, She became a polit uh, history, uh, political science professor. And uh, with, with her expertise on African-American studies, of course. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> and uh, so that was very interesting. But the the protests at the pool went on off and on for a few days. And the but the more the protests went on, it wasn't the people at the pool so much who were getting stirred up. But it was people who wouldn't even have gone to the pool in the first place. That the clan and I think the powers that be. The, the, the local authorities were stirring up to um, they just intended to get rid to kill Robert really and therefore try to kill the movement by killing him and now I, I assume that this, this was not just a reaction to the pool protest this, this was right. these people had built up a lot of frustrations yes 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 and Robert yeah because um, at one time, the governor sent a black man, a Dr. Larkins, in, who was the governor's Negro, sent him into Monroe to find out what Robert wanted. And Robert gave him the 10-point plan that the, the NAACP and Civic League and all had agreed on, which included jobs, and which included equal pay, and which included integration of the schools, and either the provision of a pool or the setting aside of days that black kids can use a pool. Ten points. And Robert told Dr. Larkin, what I want is the ten-point plan implemented. And doctor said, uh, I didn't come down here to find out what your 10 points is, I want, the governor wants to know what you want individually, what you want. And Robert told him again, I want what my people want, and my people want this 10 point plan. And so when they found out, when the governor found out that Robert was not going to sell out the movement, he can't, couldn't be bribed, then that's when all hell broke loose and, and these people start to say, well, we got to kill him. He's not going to give in. 
uh, even the NAACP, after the after they had suspended him for saying that we needed to defend ourselves, they sent a man down and told him that if he would renounce his statement that about violence, that they would take him to New York and make him the biggest Negro leader in the country. Or if it wasn't the NAC, but somebody, Conrad, they contacted his lawyer, Conrad Lynn, and told him that. And uh, Conrad said, so what do you say, Rob? And Rob told him, said, go to hell. You tell him I said go to hell. And Conrad was just, oh, he was delighted. He said, well, I already told him that because I knew you. that's what you would say. <laughs> that's right. So when they found out that he was not going to give in to be elevated as a leader of the black people, sponsored by the white folks, then they say, well, if we can't buy him, we got to kill him. Then three attempts that I know about on his life. I was behind him in cars twice. Did you tell me a little bit about that? The, the first couple I know, if, yeah. if, I remember, if I'm thinking of the right one, yeah. happened during the pool protest? Yes, 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 yes. Could, could you tell me about that one? Yeah. Uh, we were on, on the way to the pool. Uh, Robert, the kids had been taken to the pool. Robert had gone to get pick up some more kids, and then uh, Mrs. Johnson and I, who was one of our uh, co-workers, Asley, e we were behind, Rob was in the car with one of the kids, and we were in the car behind Rob. Of course, we had our pistols on the seat, and we were going down this road, uh, Roosevelt Boulevard, um, got to the place where they had a little, um, it was a highway patrol station up on the hill. And Rob was driving his little Hillman car. And um, when we left uh, this side of town and were trying to follow Rob to the pool, a car came alongside and cut in between us. And then another car came and cut in in front of that car, and we couldn't get around, but the other car started bumping into his car and trying to run him off the side of the road. Well, going down that hill, if, if they had run him off the side of the road in that little car, it would have killed him. And um, when, when we were passing the highway patrol, that scene stands out in my mind. Uh, I was waving and pointing. The highway patrolmen, two of them, were standing out watching what was going on. And just watching. And just watching. And I was standing, I, I was in the car pointing to what was going on in front of us, and they were just standing there laughing, you know. That was one time when they tried to kill him, but he was able to maneuver and get away. And I think what happened is the, I think he said that the car seat jammed on the rifle, else he would have been able, he would have had to kill somebody who was trying to kill him. Then when he tried to get, uh, get the uh, people um, arrested who had done that the policeman Mooney told him well you go get him and bring him in and we'll consider arresting him well now you know even though Rob knew who it was had he gone on his property to try to get him and bring him in he would have been killed right then so that was one of the situations and the other one was when we were protesting again at the pool and uh, they blocked him off and they uh, were getting ready to police were getting ready to kill him except that one of the that he got out and Rob got out with his gun long rifle which would he had one of the kids to hand to him and when he went to uh, 
to put a bullet in the chamber, this big long bullet about that long fell out. And then the people, they were getting ready to lynch him that day. They were talking about pour gasoline on the niggas, kill them, you know, burn them up. That was it. That was at Hilltop, yeah. That was, a, and we were behind him at that time. They, they in a different car. They stopped his car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and were there a lot of white people out there? Yeah, just it. It just seems like hundreds and hundreds. Was it? Uh, and the police were just directing traffic and pretending they didn't see it until he stepped out with the with the rifle. And when he stepped out to the rifle, and they found out that he was armed. Then they came running and tried to disarm him at that place, and he would not be disarmed. And finally, they had to, they let him out of there because he was armed, and they were they weren't about to disarm him, so he was able to escape that time. All he had was a rifle. He had a rifle, but then the young kid on the other side had uh, his Luger, I believe it was his Luger. And when the when the policeman went to the side of the car and was going to shoot Rob in the back, the kid put the gun out the window and told him, "If you if you pull that trigger, you dead." And he backed up. That cop backed up and fell in the ditch. But then fate, I guess, was with us. God was with us. <laughs> Those prayers that his mother and my mother and everybody else had had and I'll the neighbors protected, say. protected us. So And the young people had been well trained. Yes. That took a lot of restraint. Yes, it did. Not and to shoot. Not to shoot, and yes. To let the mm -hmm. situation play out. Yes. Mm -hmm. A lot of kids mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of kids would have just gone on and shot. And then all of them would have been killed at that time. They would have been wiped out. They would have been wiped out, but God is good. And you said there was a third time? Um, that was going down Morgan Mill Road one time, and it seemed that Rob, I think Rob outran them. They weren't able to stop him. We were just going down Morgan Mill Road to the pool. That was after they had butchered up his car. You know, when I told you they were jamming his car that time, uh, they knocked out one of his headlights. And uh, so I think it was the following Saturday, or one, follow one Saturday following that, we had just put out the Crusader, and we were out distributing it. And uh, he was uh, going down one of the back streets near Winchester Avenue, and um, he was going down Fairley Avenue, and it was about dusk dark. And the police pulled him over and told him that uh, he was under arrest for driving a vehicle with, uh, that he didn't have any lights on. And he said, well, it's not dark yet. Why would I be having lights on? And they said, well, it's time for you to have the lights on, and since you don't have your lights on, we're going to arrest you and take you to town. And so somehow he was able to convince them that, well, let me drive my car, and I'll drive the car on, and then, you know, I'll follow you, and I'll go on. And that was down Fairley Avenue, and our street, Boyd Street, ran into Fairley Avenue. And when he got to our street, the police had already passed Boyd Street. He turned in, and then he turned into our driveway. Yeah, he, he didn't think they were going to take him to jail or, or what, what? Oh, yeah. He, he felt that what they were getting ready to do, and we all felt, knew that what they were getting ready to do was set him up for a lynching for that night. And so he wasn't about to go to that jail with them. He convinced them somehow that he would follow them to jail. And then he turned off and came into the our driveway 
And I heard the tires screeching and all of that. And so I was inside the house and uh, I knew something was up. I didn't know what had happened, but I came out with the shotgun and uh, he jumped out of, the, out of the car, his car, and tried to was trying to get our dog loose because our dog was a German Shepherd and he was bad. And I was standing there with the shotgun. So that's when the police came up and they jumped out of the car and they were saying they're going to take him to jail. And I said, do you have a warrant? And they said, they backed up and they saw me with the shotgun. And so I said, if you don't have a warrant, you're not taking him anywhere. And so <laughs> I guess I was shaken like a leaf. And they said, this crazy woman is nervous and crazy enough to shoot us. And they got in their car. What was Rob doing at this time? He was trying. He was struggling with the dog because the dog was <laughs> raging against the chain, you know. And uh, and then, well, once he saw that uh, the police was all, they were getting scared, and I handed the, the shotgun to him, and they really flew then. I bet <laughs> And uh, later on, uh, one of the neighbors said, oh. So that first time they ever seen the police run that fast out of a neighborhood. <laughs> and did they, and, did they arrest Ronald? No. Ever. And they never did come back. They never did come back. But we got the we got our uh, gun club together that night because we felt like they were coming back. I told them, man, well, don't come back unless you got a warrant. But they never did get a warrant and they never did come back. They knew they were wrong. They knew they were wrong. And it wasn't even dark. You know, uh, so that's another time they would have killed him. That for sure. Okay. Yes. 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 I did get tired of it. I was scared. Did Rob? To, um, there were times when he was just disgusted with it all and and would liked would have liked to have gone away. And uh, he uh, he got the opportunity to travel to do uh, speaking uh, during the Kissing case, so that he got 